Hello, everyone. I'm Megan Roloff, Director of Member Engagement and Partnerships with ACLP. Welcome back to Child Life in Action, our video series where we highlight the amazing work being done by child life specialists and share ideas and insights from our members. Today, I'm thrilled to be joined by Megan Ribbons, a certified child life specialist doing community-based work in South Africa. So Megan, I'm gonna turn it over to you to just kind of tell us a little bit about yourself and how you wound up on this path. <laughs> um, wonderful, I'm so happy to be having this conversation with you today. Uh, my name is Megan Ribbons, as you said. Um, I was certified back in, I think it was 2007, the first time, um, found child life in high school in a career book, actually, and oh. just knew I wanted to do child life. The, the field was very new still, um, but I just loved, I loved how it combined my, my joy for education and for um, psychosocial needs. It just combined a lot of my interest, and, and I was really thrilled to um, when I got to get into the field through um, Helen DeVos Children's Hospital in Grand Rapids, Michigan, I did my internship there and I was a, I, I worked as a certified child life specialist for three years in the specialty clinics and then helping um, in different departments as they needed throughout the hospital. Um, and, and then unexpectedly, we moved to Nigeria, where we spent eight years living with our family, and now we've been in South Africa for seven years. Um, so my, my journey with child life started very traditional in the hospital setting, um, but did start in the clinics, which I think positioned me to, um, to think innovatively when I all of a sudden I found myself in countries where child life didn't exist in hospitals and I had to think, you know, do I just leave this profession? Do I leave this part behind me or is there a way that I can play a role? Um, so yeah, that, the last 15 years has been trying to figure out, you know, what is the essence of child life and, and how can I fit in these community settings where I'm living now? So you mentioned, you know, being in Nigeria and now South Africa, countries that don't have um, really an established child life presence in hospitals, but you're making this work in the community. So I'm just wondering, um, you know, do, I imagine you get a lot of questions, maybe even more so than the average child life specialist on the wait, so you're a what, what do you do? And I'm just curious if maybe there are scope of practice things that come up when you're working in a place where um, child life's really kind of an unknown. Yes, when I moved to Nigeria, we moved for my husband's job, so I didn't move for a child life job. Um, when when we moved to Nigeria, I was really in that that phase of like, what what do I do? You know, what do I do with? I can't I can't develop. You know, I wasn't in a place to develop a child life program. I had three small children at the time, um, but I. I, I, ref I just had time to reflect because I didn't have an immediate need to find a job. So uh, I reflect on what is the essence of child life? I've always thought of it in hospitals. And at the time, there was very little talk about child life specialists in community or alternative settings. Um, but I thought, what, what really is child life? More than just pokes and, you know, the things I knew it to be in a hospital setting. And I thought, wait a second, um, we know about child development we are family centered, which means we promote families and the strength of families. We promote play and we, we promote expression and we, we, we promote ways to empower the child. And I thought, well, if that's who we are as child life, I can, I can for sure do that in the setting. So initially in Nigeria, um, I was noticing a lot of every, every week we were hearing about friends who were telling us about early and preventable deaths in the community. Um, and so every week we were hearing about a new death and it just felt like death was everywhere. And I was noticing children weren't often a part of that picture, even if they were part of the families who were grieving. And so I just thought, let's, let's create experiences for children to remember because they often weren't part of um, the, the collective remembering with adults. Mm. They were around, but I thought, let's, let's just experiment and see if this works. So we, we started what we called Sankofa Saturday. Sankofa in West Africa means looking back in order to move forward. So it was all play-based and it was memory making. We made uh, plaques or books about the people we were remembering. And it was amazing how much the adults were excited about this, so much so that they were taking all the resources because they hadn't had opportunities to process their own grief. And all of a sudden it just felt like if adults haven't processed their own 
like, this isn't right for us to be doing this with children. It just contextually, it, it wasn't the right time to be doing that. So painfully, I had to say, this isn't right. I need to stop because um, the adults needed to be trained more. Um, and in that time, someone literally came knocking to my door. Uh, it was a friend of a friend, Lydia of Boggy Child Entertainment came saying, I've had this dream for four years. Um, I, I want to call a program through their eyes. And, and I know children are capable of more than we give them credit for in our society. And I would like to see if we give them a camera, if they can show us what they see. But she said, I'm not a photographer and I'm not a teacher. But someone told me you could help me. And for, it combined a lot of my passions. I love photography as a hobby. Um, I am a trained teacher. And then with my child life training, understanding child development and the importance of psychosocial care, um, it combined a lot of loves for me. And we thought, let's ex again, let's experiment and just see. But this was this was a need that was expressed. And there were more people to come around it because they understood it and it was asked for. And we were amazed. The first one, we didn't go so heavy on the psychosocial. It was just more of a playful, you know, giving kids cameras. And then we just saw how much, how much it promoted healing because kids were able to express ideas they had where they maybe didn't have a place to say these things, or maybe they didn't even have the words to express things. And things they expressed were quite impressive. Um, and what it did was it really connected the community to children in a place where children aren't always seen. Um, so right away, we knew he had touched on something. So that's one of the things that I have kept doing since 2011 is developing therapeutic photography programs. Um, and since we found it worked, really went back to my child life scope of practice to say, okay, what is it we do, right? Child life is preventative. We're not therapists. And yet we promote a lot of therapeutic play that promotes self-healing and mastery and expression. Um, and so I built my programs around resilience and around expression and around children connecting to the places that build their resiliency. So never, you know, bonding myself with a child, but pushing them to their parents and to their teachers and to the people in their community who can, who will help support them, you know, throughout when this program is finished. And so that's, I, I really used my child life scope of practice to fine tune my program um, to develop this resiliency. Then also working with, in, I, I work with schools mostly and NGOs that typically have a social worker or therapist they're connected to. So if a child isn't able to process their story or has troubles, if we notice they're having troubles processing their story through what we're doing, then we refer to people who can help them in deeper ways. But just having a platform to tell your story, to make meaning out of your story, it's amazing how a lot of kids can bounce back from really hard things when we provide these just spaces and these tools. You mentioned earlier that a lot of the adults, the parents, other family members hadn't had opportunities to process their own grief. And you, know, you were giving these opportunities for children. I'm curious, was there ever any um, pushback to that? Just was, was this going outside of cultural norms or how, how was that received? No, we tried. Um... I think living within communities, it's never been for me dipping into just visiting, you know, a Nigerian community or visiting South Africa. I've, I've lived here. My children have gone to local schools. And so um, <laughs> we have had a lot of adapting to do ourselves. <laughs> it's been a huge learning curve and fantastic for our family. Um, but we've always tried to look at what are ways that are familiar within the culture, right? Some of the things are new like therapeutic photography was new, but art isn't new. Dance and singing wasn't new. Storytelling isn't new. So I try to, you know, when I, when I write programs or implement programs, look at what is already familiar in the community, what is celebrated, what's a way of connecting that they're already experiencing. And, and then sometimes there's a shift in it, right? So it is a little bit different, but it's within something that's already familiar. And I always write it with a South African or with a Nigerian. It wasn't just me doing the programs. It was working with people who could say, mm, Megan, no, <laughs> this isn't going to work. Or, no, this topic isn't going to work. Or this, I work with people who um, feel very free to correct me and to make suggestions and to add their own voice into the program. 
That's great. It's, it's a good blend of, you know, you coming with this very specific child life background, but kind of really, it sounds like really marrying it to the environment that you're in and leaning on your local experts that have grown up and lived in that environment and can kind of guide. That's, that's yeah. beautiful. And play is truly universal. And as child life specialists, we are all about play, right? <laughs> it's, it can be very serious work and very therapeutic, but you, you find play everywhere in all types of forms. So that is definitely a child life specialist. I feel like we can tap into a language that really is universal for, for children and for families. Sure. Now, you're in South Africa right now. And, um, you know, obviously the specific histories between the U.S. and South Africa are quite different, but mm -hmm. there is still that underlying shared history of overt racism, state sanctioned segregation, and you know the the history of that, the, the of the legal segregation in South Africa is actually still quite recent within our lifetimes, mm -hmm. um, and just you know given recent events in the U.S. Um, I think something that we're all kind of grappling with a little bit right now is making sure we're really effectively and sensitively supporting children and families, especially children and families that identify as black or people of color. And, um, you know, really kind of looking at ourselves too and how some of the um, direct and systemic racism from, from those histories are still, you know, still having ripple effects today, still playing out today. And I'm just curious if you can share a little bit about your experience, you know, as a white woman working in an environment, you know, certain not the same as the U.S., but with similar historical themes. Um, yeah, very, very, very parallel history. <laughs> they really are. They really are. Um, yeah. And in it's much more immediate um, mm -hmm. in terms of you know within within people's lifetimes in South Africa that some of these state sanctioned things were still in place. So I'm just curious if you can kind of share your, any learnings you've had in yeah. working in that space. Yeah, um, when we, we were only 22 when we initially moved to Nigeria, my husband and I, and it just rocked our world. I came from a very um, non-confrontational, corner of America. <laughs> we don't do confrontation well. We're very loving and kind, but confrontation is not one of our strengths. And I moved to Nigeria, which is even within the continent of Africa, known to be a very aggressive place. Even other other countries and within the continent will say, oh, you know, Nigeria is so aggressive and it is, but they're aggressive in every way. I mean, they argue aggressively. They celebrate aggressively. Just everything is just almost, it feels like it has an exclamation point on it in Nigeria. Oh. And that took some major adjusting to, um, but in reflecting on our journey, it was so, it was such a gift to be displaced, um, to not be in a majority, um, to experience even, even with, within our living as foreigners and living as, you know, a minority, there are you know, very, very, very few white people in Nigeria. And if they are, they're either married into a Nigerian family or they're, they're a foreigner working in the country. So to, to be a minority was such an important experience for me. Um, and it invited a process for us to reflect on our own story for the first time. You know, I was classic example of growing up thinking other people had culture. I, I just had my life, right? Culture was what other people had who looked different to me, not realizing I had my own culture and I had no language to define it. So when I was outside of my own culture, it started to help me to realize what are our cultural values in my subculture that I was growing up in? You know, what are typical American values and how is that playing out in my life? We think a lot of the things we choose are, you know, I'm choosing to live this way, but actually we're influenced by the cultural values we grow up within, which can be wonderful, but it also can be quite harmful if we're not aware of what those things are. Um, so Nigeria displaced me. It's it, Nigerians, they just, they have their own set of rules that they're very proud of. And you can't just go in there and think, oh, I'm going to do things my way. That was such a gift to have that control taken away from us. Um, because even though I was living as, you know, a foreigner and, and, and not in the majority anymore, I still had power because, be, be, because of being white. Um, and I, I had no idea 
that I even carried that kind of power. I had no idea what I represented to people. Um, so Nigeria just kind of reframed everything for us and gave us this whole new set of rules to live by, which were so different to our own. And then when we lived, we moved to South Africa, that was really the first time we started to reflect our own, on our own history. So as a white person, it has been so important for me to reflect on my own story, but also what is my history? You know, I was, I was told a version of history in high school, you know, of a book that was written by white people for everybody. <laughs> But I, I never read Minority Voices. I didn't know any minority people growing up. Um, and, and so becoming familiar with our own story, South Africa invited that process. And that's been really good to know when I walk into a room, it's just not me that's walking into a room. I represent things. Even if I wasn't part of slavery, I represent that. And I carry a power that I need to know so that I know what to do with it. I know how to share it. I know how to... Uh, I, I know t how to displace myself in a room. Um, and, and that's taken a lot of trial and error, but a lot of honesty to, to just recognize and name things and then to say, hmm, how is this playing out? Um, yeah, so it's been really important for us to reflect on our own history. <laughs> um, and, and just to have that awareness of what we represent. Um, I even had it recently in a program I did with, I, I did my first program for parents and children together with photography. So the parents took pictures and the children took pictures of the same things so we could compare and learn from each other as families. And I thought I had a really strong relationship with this community already. And when we, when we started the program, very quickly I realized something is amiss. This is not going well. <laughs> what is going on? And, and I just realized I'm going to have to inv individually visit the families because no one understood a thing I said. I thought, was it my accent? Was it my, my, my whiteness? Like, what was it that was so disorienting for everyone that no one understood anything? And then someone just said, no, man, it, we understood you. It was your skin. We typically are we only know white people as our bosses and we were unsure of how, of what to expect from you in this situation. And so we decided we couldn't even hear you before you spoke. Um, and I think as white people, we don't realize that's the power we carry. Yeah. And, and people don't know what to do sometimes in those situations. So we can enter a room, we can think we connected with people. Like I imagine way back before some of my cultural awareness started to, to grow, um, when I was in child life in the hospital and, you know, working with a family and maybe that wasn't from America or that was a minority in America, walking into a room thinking I really connected with them when I probably just connected through my power in ways that I understood. Um, and I didn't have that awareness. I'd love to go back <laughs> to redo some of that um, because it's really hard, I think, um, to, under to fully understand the power that we carry as white people. And, and, and then how to, especially in a culture where in America, we're very time oriented, you know, everything's valued by time and efficiency, especially in a hospital setting, right? I mean, child life specialists are already known for taking too much time, <laughs> right? Because it's an efficient hospital system, but relationship oriented cultures, even though I thought I was taking time to develop relationships, I needed to do double the effort because I still have that drive to be, to be time oriented rather than relationship oriented. Um, and, and so just constantly being aware of that and asking questions and being open to that critique has been really important for my own growth and my own awareness so that I can be more effective when I do go into communities. Thank you for sharing that. And I, for kind of giving us an example of how that power that, we often carry as white people without even realizing um, yeah. can can be a barrier when it's all good. It's all good intent that wanting to provide a program, wanting to help, wanting to connect, but that power is still there unless you do actively do something to you know get get beyond that power. Yeah, so yeah. Thank you and and understand. I mean, I was thinking back to um, just a topic such as attachment. For example, I mean, we learn very specifically what attachment is and what happens when we don't have healthy attachment for caregivers and children. But living in cultures 
that define attachment differently. Um, I, you know, I grew up with the nuclear family was kind of the model family or what we measured things to, right? Um, growing, living now in communities for 15 years where children attach to multiple caregivers. Um, they live with the parents, but then they also live with aunties and uncles for a while. And then they live with nannies. And then they, for me, I, I didn't have a construct for it. Like, is that okay? Like, is that healthy? How, how can that be like, isn't that damaging to the child? I had no concept for communal living and for this multiple attachment. Um, Dan Siegel talks a, a bit about this. And I was really, I was really grateful to find him talking about it within a Western perspective, because I always grew up thinking attached, it's little, right? It's, 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 we attach within our nuclear families and, oh, it's broken family if it comes outside of that. Um, but that's not the case for many places in the world. And I, and I think as child life specialists to have frameworks that allow for more than maybe what the books have defined outside of our own culture, what that has defined is really important because that changes for example, in the hospital setting, if we have family visiting, right? Who is family then? Like, how could an auntie right. be immediate family when she's your auntie? Sorry, no. <laughs> so I think as child life specialists, having this broader understanding of how families are defined and who qualifies as family can help be as, help us be advocates in the hospital system for, for our policies to be formed in such a way that allows for these more these broader definitions that maybe um, we don't understand because of our experience and because of the, the very single story that has been pitched to us in our own learning and experience. Right. Well, and I think that, you know, relates to a larger conversation that's happening within the field right now of a lot of the, you know, kind of go-to child life theorists and um, developmental things that we look at. If we look at how those, theories were created, what the studies were like, um, we're looking really at white, middle-class or affluent families and of, of a certain time. And there's, there's so much more possible than that. So much more possible. Yeah. And Amanda Adichie is a, is a well-known Nigerian author. She spends half her time in America and half in Nigeria. And she has a TED talk from years ago called The Danger of a Single Story. And she says, it's not that the single story isn't true. It's that it isn't complete. And I think often oh we take that single story and we do make it a standard when that is a story. We're not saying that's not true either but there is a fuller picture that we need to be aware of in order to provide care for all of the families that we experience. Well, and resisting the urge to put a value judgment on it, that the single story is the goal or the ideal, whereas it's not inherently better or worse than any other story. Yeah, and I, and I think because of our media, because of the way our history has been taught, um, I'm hearing the word on social media a lot, anti-Blackness. and. And, and, and that is, that is what our dominant single story has done. We, I mean, I've, I, I wrote a program called Cinderella Travels the World tr to try to address issues of xenophobia and to um, build positive identity, um, identity formation for kids to really affirm where they came from and who they are and what their roots are. Um, Cinderella was actually written in China in the ninth century and all the other versions have come from that version, which I didn't know. Huh. Uh, there's hundreds of Cinderella stories out there. And so we use that as one of our holiday program basis um, to affirm other cultures, uh, to celebrate other cultures, and then to articulate our own identity a little bit better. And so many of the black girls in the program would say, but she can't be Cinderella, she's, she's brown. So we have really intentionally and unintentionally affirmed this single story of beauty, of worthiness, of all of these things, right? And so this anti-blackness is experienced by both black and white people. And it takes a lot of intentional effort to highlight other types of beauty, to affirm other types of beauty. Um, and, and, and that for me, that's part of child life work, right? We're all about identity formation and creating new awareness, empowering. So to empower identity for me is, is a role that we, we have a big part of. That's fantastic. 
So, um, you know, jumping back a little bit, what is the most, thinking about your work internationally, I, that's something that I think there's a lot of interest in, in the child life field, but um, I'm just curious if you could share for, you know, anyone listening that might be considering doing, doing something internationally, what's the most challenging part of it and what's most rewarding? The most challenging, hands down, is that it can be quite lonely. <laughs> not only is the profession not understood, um, like in the places that I've lived, um, I think there's, I, I've been really excited to see more talk about community child, community workers in child life um, on, on the association because it, for a long time, I thought, am I the only one? Like, who else is doing this? Or am I am I doing something wrong? You know, am I violating our scope of practice? Because, you know, it, the it it we were defined by our hospital work as child life specialists, and so it can be a bit lonely. <laughs> um, it can be lonely work being in an in the international and community setting. I would say, um, the rewards are I have grown so much by working with people. Um, in a different culture. I've learned about different value systems, about different ways of being. Um, it's really stretched me personally and professionally, and it's grown our families in ways that I, it, my own family, in ways that we couldn't have imagined. It was, yeah, I, I couldn't have imagined. Nigeria was like <laughs> such a dream. It was like, I didn't know something like that existed out there. Um, I and And we are forever grateful for how it has kind of collapse the boxes that we held, had constructed about the world to say, that's one version, but wow, like there's all these versions and there's all these ways of being. Um, I would say it's also rewarding to work collaboratively with people outside of the child life profession. So um, I have a, uh, the only certified child life specialist currently in South Africa is Karen Vinsile and we work very closely together. Um, she's also a play therapist. Um, since there isn't, you know, there isn't a lot of momentum in hospitals, she focuses on medical patients. So she sees people in her private practice, but together we've been finding ways to promote play and to do innovative work. And I, and I think one of the rewarding things for me is that because a child life system doesn't exist in this country, we've had to be very innovative to say, how can this work? Where can this work? So, for example, we consult with a design department in a local university here, and they are developing play toolkits for children to increase coping mechanisms and to promote healing. If I was in a hospital, I don't know if I would have let my imagination go to that place because there wasn't a construct for how child life could unfold here. So I think um, that's definitely been a reward to be able to think innovatively and think how can we push, not push the boundaries of child life, but how can we expand the possibilities of how child life can influence and provide healing in the world? That's fantastic. Um, we're just about out of time, but I was wondering if you had any kind of last advice for child life specialists that might want to be pursue mm -hmm. either international work or community-based work. I would say if you do international work, definitely come through an invitation of local people. Um, we as Americans are, we are groomed from the time we are born to be independent and to give our voice. And those are wonderful things. And I, you know, people will even say to my children have grown up now in Nigeria and South Africa, but they'll say, wow, like they have such a sense of voice and wow, you can tell they're American children. <laughs> um, so that's definitely a good thing. You know, we don't, we're not shy to share our opinions or our ideas or to come forward with ideas. But in a lot of places in the world, that's not always received so well. So to come through an invitation and then also to not go in with set solutions, to keep that. So not to go in with child life, hospital, this is what it needs to look like. Um, to remember the broader picture as child life specialists, this is who we are and this is what we do. And then to listen for needs that are expressed so that you're meeting um, things that are asked for. Um, and again, like in Nigeria, it was asked for, but they weren't sure quite how to do it. So that's where then we could say, oh, okay, let's try this, right? But it was still an asked, 
it, it, it was asked for. It was a, a need that was articulated. And then I could say, okay, let's, you know, all my child life tools leads me to let's try this. Um, but I would say waiting for invitations, keeping that big picture. And then also knowing that just having a general awareness of our own culture because often we bring our own culture as much as we bring our profession. So having an awareness of, of who we are, where we've come from, what our history is, so that something like being time oriented, we can be very conscious of, of leaning into building relationships before, you know, having therapeutic relationships is one of our, you know, founding things as a child life specialist, building those therapeutic relationships. But in places, in countries where they are, more relationship oriented, it takes probably double to triple the time that we assume it will take to develop the relationship. So just to be very patient and to not see that as wasted time, but to see that as very important time so that we can get to the work. Sure. That's great advice. Thank you, Megan. Um, this has been just Absolutely wonderful. I love talking with you. I hope um, for anyone watching that you know, this has hopefully given you lots to think about. Um, and just thank you, Megan, so much for making the time today. I really appreciate it. You are welcome. It was so wonderful to be with you. All right. Thanks again. And for everyone else, we'll see you for our next Child Life in Action.